I'd like to welcome our next guests um, who are from DoorDash. Um, welcome to Hian Liu, Head of Machine Learning Infrastructure and Cornell Cernai, Software Engineer Machine Learning Platform. Hian is particularly passionate about the intersection between big data and AI and is the author of Beginning Apache Spark 2 book. Cornell is an MLOps enthusiast, uh, primarily focusing on model training prediction and observability aspects of ML. Together, they're here to share their platform ML journey and story, as well as technical details of how they work through the scaling challenges and approaches to ML observability. Welcome, Hian and Cornell. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Scaling DoorDash ML Platform Responsibly. In this session, my colleague Cornell and myself are the presenter. A little bit about me, my name is Hing Lu, and I lead the ML platform team at DoorDash. Prior to that, I work at LinkedIn as well as Uber. And now I'll let Cornell to introduce himself. Hi everyone, I'm Cornell. I'm a staff software engineer uh, at the machine learning platform team at DoorDash. Previously, I worked uh, at Cora as a software engineer, and I've been at DoorDash for 11 months. Okay, in this session, first I will share a quick overview about DoorDash and a few uh, interesting machine learning use cases in the food order delivery lifecycle. Then share a few stories about how we scale our ML platform. After that, Cornell will present our approach to ML observability. And finally, he will end the presentation with lessons learned and future work. At DoorDash, our mission is to grow and empower local economies. And one of the ways we do that is through a set of product offering. First one is food, food delivery and pickup, where customers like you and me can order food on demand for breakfast, lunch, or dinner. Second is the convenience and grocery, where customers can order everything from non-food related items, such as sunscreen, to possibly an entire weeks of groceries. And the third product is called DaskPass which is a subscription product that is similar to Amazon Prime, and it gives you savings on every order as well as special deals and offers. You probably can guess or have heard that DoorDash is a three-sided marketplace. And like most of these marketplaces, it has this flywheel effect, meaning the more activity there are on the marketplace, the greater the value it will bring to all the parties, like consumers, dashers, and merchants. For example, when there are more customers, then there will be more orders and there'll be more opportunities for dashers. And when there are more dashers, mean better experience for our customers. Also, when there are more orders, that will attract more merchants, which means more selections for you and me to choose from. And as this flywheel speeds up, as you can see, it brings benefits to all three sides. So now let's go into some of the machine learning use cases on the DoorDash marketplace. And we'll do that in the context of the life cycle of a restaurant food order delivery. And it consists of the following steps that you can see in this slide. Creating order, order checkout, dispatching order, and delivering order. So let's start with the first uh, order creation phase. This is when our customers land on DoorDash homepage. We want to surface the most compelling options to them. And this is where our recommendations models play a big role. And for whatever reason, the customer do, don't see anything they want on the homepage, they can use the search feature. And this is where another set of search and ranking models come into play. Once the food, once the food items have been added to the shopping cart, the next step is the order checkout. At the top, you see uh, are the ETAs, uh, which means the estimated arrival times, which are really important for setting customer expectations on when their food is going to be arrived. During the pandemic, there's a few interesting stories related to ETAs due to the drastic changes in the delivery patterns that you can imagine, such as no traffic on the road, and restaurants don't have any in-store customers. And one of the ways we saw that is by introducing some features that enable us to, uh, to have a faster feedback system. 
And at uh, like most internet e-commerce company, we need combat frauds. So the bottom section is the payment page. We use a series of fraud detection models to identify the fraudulent transactions. Now, once the order has been paid, then the next step is to dispatch that order. And this is where our behind the scene logistics engine takes over. So it sends the orders to merchants so they can start preparing for the food and then assigns order to the dashers so they know where to go pick it up and deliver. In order to do this, we rely on several ML predictions such as food preparation time, meaning how long does it take to prepare that order, that particular order, as well as travel time for dashers to pick up or deliver. And this has a few interesting nuances like traffic and weather. Right, where we don't have much control off. So another interesting challenge is uh, unlike Amazon orders, food orders emerge on the fly, right? As orders coming in for breakfast, lunch, and dinner in that short amount of time. And the food quality plays a very important role in the delivery or dispatching of those orders. And finally, the last step of delivering the order or the food to the customer's doorstep. First is regarding Dasher. We leverage machine learning to help in figuring out how best to invest in various acquisition channels so we can bring on new Dashers onto a platform. And once they onboard it, we also le leverage a machine to have to best mobilize them at the right time. Finally, the last step is to actually deliver the food. And this became a critical uh, stage during the pandemic where we introduced the contactless delivery. A lot of customers had difficult time finding their orders and would report their food as never delivered. So that's not a good experience at all. So we made dashers take photos of the food being delivered and sent to our customers as a confirmation. And then we used deep learning to identify whether the drop-off photo had a door to give us a strong indicator that it was actually delivered. Now let's go into our machine learning platform and a few of the scaling challenges. So these are the pillars in our platform and they are modeled after the ML development process that you can see. It starts with feature engineering and then go to model predictions and such. The approach we use in building these pillars though, starts with thinking big by working with our customers, working backwards to understand their needs, as well as building a roadmap. And then building the pieces out incrementally, right, based on the needs of the community. So we can get feedback and such, but also keeping an eye out for the long-term vision. Now, once we have onboarded more use cases on our platform, then the interesting scaling challenges emerge, and which is totally expected. So in this section, I will share a few challenges and how we tackle them. When we started out, we follow a principal approach of building out our prediction service, meaning starting with a strong foundation that works and scale it out as needed. So we have this centralized prediction service that's easy to manage, monitor, and operate. And just with this strong foundation, a few unique features we're able to support up to about 15,000 peak predictions per second. Then we took on an important and highly visible use case, search and ranking, as you can imagine. They have a much higher QPS and low latency than other use cases. So our initial approach is to scale our prediction service horizontally and vertically as much as possible. But as you can imagine, up to a certain point, the cost becomes unre unreasonable. So we step back and take a look at the spectrum of these options that you see here. On one end, right, we have one model per service, which is great for isolation, but it's not so great for hardware efficiencies and costs and such. Now on the other end of the spectrum, you have one service file model. There's absolutely no isolations, so you can and it has this noisy neighbor issues that will come up. For us, we choose the hybrid model. So what we did was we moved the noisy, the big and noisy neighbors into out into their own cluster and scaled them up 
out and independently. And that's what we did for the search and ranking use case. And with just that simple approach, our prediction service was able to support up to 10x of peak predictions. Then the next larger and more complex use case came in, which is about the recommendations on the homepage. So let's understand this use case a bit more. First, it has a much higher QPS than even the search use case. The way it works is every time a customer visits DoorDash homepage, the recommendation candidates are fetch and rank, which means that it often needs to perform thousands of predictions at one time. So scaling out is no longer an option. So we gotta do something. So that what did we do? First, we went back to the drawing board. We recognize this use case is a very essential part of the DoorDash user experience. And we also recognize that the traffic will keep increasing as the DoorDash business grows. So we decided to spend a good amount of time and effort on tuning and optimizations. So we went and looked under the hood of both our prediction service and feature store. Starting out with the first principles. Right. We know that prediction requests will occur over the network and there'll be network latency. As well as there's gonna be some costs in serialization and deserialization of the requests and the response payload. At the same time, we gotta ensure that the traffic is evenly distributed as much as possible. So no single server is overloaded with requests. So we ended up optimizing both our prediction service and feature store. So our, for our online prediction service, here says what we did. First is to avoid hotspots. So we use a combination of Kubernetes cloud native service discovery with DNS and client side load balancing to make sure that the traffic is evenly as distributed as much as possible. And to deal with large payload that take time to travel across the network, we went and explored compression. And to figure out which one, which algorithm works best for us, we went and did a benchmark. And it turns out Z standard algorithm is the one that works best. So we enabled the CRPC compression along with that algorithm. Along the way though, we discovered some of the harmless logging statements also contributed to latency. So we remove them as well. And then we on, uh, we did some optimization on our feature store, which is based on Redis. We re-examined the way we store billions of features on our feature store. So we redesigned the data structure for storing these features. So instead of having features as a flat list of key value pairs, we switched to a map or a hash data type on Redis. What this means is Redis will group related keys into a single key to reduce the number of top level keys looked up. And for complex features, in our case, it's the list features, which contains a list of cuisines and restaurants. So again, we leverage compressions to reduce the size, which translates to reducing time of transferring them over the network, as well as requiring less space to store them. As a result of that, we were able to improve CPU efficiencies, reducing memory footprint, and that translates to reducing costs by about 3x, as well as improve read latencies by about 15%. More details about those that you can find out on the blog that we have a uh, link there. So with all that optimizations, we were able to, our prediction service was able to support up to 6 million peak predictions per second. And we were able to onboard a recommendation use case. That was a lot of hard work and effort. And it was totally worth the investment. And the team really proud of the accomplishment that we've done. So with all these important use cases onboarded on a platform, then the ML observability uh, has become an important, important area that we have to pay attention to. So now I'm going to hand over to Cornell to talk more about this part. Thank you. So next up, I'm um, going to be talking about the story of machine learning observability at DoorDash. 
So once we integrated our machine learning systems with our product, we saw a need for monitoring. Data scientists wanted to know what decisions we were making and why. We then consulted with our data scientists to understand what would be most helpful for them. Based on that feedback, we quickly implemented the first version of monitoring using MLOps principles. We immediately saw the benefits of monitoring, so we ended up also iterating on it to get more out of it. As Hian mentioned, uh, ML gives us a reliable signal for the time it takes for a restaurant to prepare a food order, as well as how long it will take the order to reach the customer. However, once the ML model is deployed to production, it immediately be begins degrading, and this degradation negatively affects the accuracy of our time estimates. Most predictions tend to deviate from the expected distribution over time. For example, a shift could be the result of an external event, such as the COVID-19 pandemic, which caused a shift in how customers interacted with DoorDash. And in our case, had we had monitoring, we would have been able to detect these shifts much sooner and fix our models. So what should be monitored in an ML system? Because ML models are derived from data patterns, their inputs and outputs need to be closely monitored in order to diagnose and prevent model drift. We believe that model monitoring and testing should be present at every step of the way, but we are focusing on the three major steps, model training, model prediction, and general system performance. So first I'll be covering model training. During model training, we want to make sure that the inputs that we feed into the model are as expected. We verify that there are no excessive amounts of missing values and the distributions of features are correct. We also focus heavily on tracking these results for reproducibility. We heavily rely on open source tools such as MLflow to keep track of these model training runs. We also look at Shapley values, feature importances, and feature distributions. The next area I'll cover is model prediction. In our production environment, when we receive a prediction, we log it along with the features and the predicted value to Snowflake. Our main approach is then to construct queries against these tables to derive statistics such as average or percentiles. For the most part, we consider numerical values, but it could be extended to different types. Uh, as we earlier mentioned, we might look into uh, other types of objects in predictions. In the case of production feature monitoring, similarly to training time, we want to perform certain checks on features. So we collect descriptive statistics and we pay special attention to the number of default values and zero values. As you can see in these graphs, we keep track of these values over time. We also want to monitor the outputs of ML models, the predictions. We monitor descriptive statistics similar to feature monitoring. For example, we predict the expected time it takes for an order to be delivered, and we want to monitor those values over time. We want to make sure that there are no unexpected outliers in, in order to like continuously provide a great user experience for DoorDash customers. While understanding descriptive statistical properties of our predictions is valuable, a more useful metric would tell us how close uh, our predicted values are to true values. In the case of delivery estimate, we can infer the true delivery time by the difference between the when the deliverer was placed and when it was delivered. There are still a few key challenges with determining which evaluation metric to use or how to refine them for a monitoring system. In some applications, such as uh, the prep preparation time modeling, the data is censored. That means that uh, there are some measurements that might not be available to us. In other applications, such as predicting fraudulent orders, the true value might not become available for weeks uh, after the payment was made because the payment processors and banks are still working on the order. One commonality between these two cases is that the predicted and true values need to be stored separately. So true values are often available either explicitly or implicitly in our database given a prediction ID. 
once we make the connection between production ID and the database row with the true value, we can uh, build a join query and use one of the commonly available evaluation metrics. And some computations can be done using elementary operations, but for more complex metrics, we can use Spark jobs in a distributed manner. And then finally, in terms of metrics, uh, ML tests can be categorized based on what type of prediction they make. For example, regressions uh, might benefit from using a metric such as mean squared error, but for classifications, we, we might want to use uh, precision and recall. So we built a framework that supports a large variety of different metrics for different use cases. So here's an example of mean absolute error over a period of month for the prep time model. You can see that there are various anomalies that can be picked up, such as the error rate spiking at some point. Another important aspect of monitoring is the system health and performance. We follow standard service reliability best practices and monitor requests and prediction counts, such as availability and uh, latency. We have tight alerting on each of these components. Since other systems, such as delivery, ETA, and fraud rely on prediction, it can have significant impact on those. One of the key advantages we had is the presence of good infrastructure foundational building blocks at DoorDash. We were able to leverage our internal Terraform repository for alerting, where we can create queries using uh, PromQL for uh, uh, Grafana. We can also add thresholds and connect alerts to either a team specific Slack channel or pager duty. Uh, we were also able to take advantage of standard tools in the industry, such as Kafka and MLflow. Along the way, we saw five key benefits of developing our production monitoring system. The first one is leveraging existing tools. We can design a configurable and flexible platform for displaying metrics and setting up alerts by reusing tools. The second is that there is no onboarding required, which means that data scientists don't need to individually write code or add monitoring to their training pipeline. They also do not have to think about the scalability and reliability of our monitoring solution. With regards to open source standards, by, by using them, uh, using tools such as Prometheus and Grafana, data scientists and engineers do not need to learn a homegrown system and they can get started immediately. With, we also provide easy, easy visualization. So graphing tools such as Grafana offer like a great set of features with interactivity and uh, splits and historical data. And then we also want to make this platform self-service so that data scientists can use this tool without the help of the platform team. Next up, I will talk about how our platform evolved and what results we saw. With the first release, we had a fully functional monitoring, graphing, and alerting workflow for detecting model drift. Thanks to the close consulting and coordination with data scientists, we were able to onboard many teams for the first release. Based on their usage, feedback, we made several improvements. In the first release, we enabled monitoring flexibly by allowing uh, data scientists to configure specific metrics that they wanted for specific feature names. Uh, but this had the drawback of uh, they had to onboard uh, their models and feature names. But in our second release, we actually uh, completely rewrote this so that data scientists no longer have to define these. Uh, instead, uh, they get an out-of-the-box uh, experience. And secondly, we also initially calculated statistics both at the hourly and daily aggregation level. But it turns out the hourly aggregation levels were far more useful, so we pivoted to um, focusing on those using a real-time processing pipeline. And then finally, the improvement of evaluation metrics proved to be very useful as well. Uh, in terms of results, uh, the launch of the monitoring enabled us to actively monitor the performance of ML models, which was especially good for internal teams at DoorDash, to logistics and fraud. Providing model monitoring as an out-of-the-box experience was very well received by our internal data science committee, and feedback was immensely positive. As an example of a success story, 
we applied our monitoring system to fraud ML models. And we noticed a sudden change in the distribution of predicted values. Uh, this later kicked off an investigation into feature extraction, which revealed a potential issue, and we were able to prevent uh, a larger problem. To wrap up, I'll cover lessons learned and future work for the entirety of today's presentation. First, scaling doesn't always work. Sometimes you have to think outside the box and get back to the drawing board. Providing out-of-box solutions is preferable in most cases. Automation is key for any large-scale uh, system. So if you have also have uh, good foundation tools, uh, it's preferred that you use them. We've also learned that um, working closely with customers can be necessary for a good outcome. Looking forward, we want to make incremental improvements to our monitoring system. For model prediction optimizations, uh, we want to uh, we want to do certain optimizations for model prediction. For example, we want to cache uh, feature values and predictions. Regarding model serving, uh, we want to generalize uh, what types of models we want to we we can serve. Um, so moving forward, we want to uh, see more use cases on our platform for uh, natural language processing and image processing. And then with uh, distributed statistics and alert thresholds are powerful, uh, but in some cases uh, the shift can be gradual. And so some sort of anomaly detection system would be beneficial for us. And then oftentimes ML models can produce unexpected results that can be difficult to interpret, delaying investigation. So what we're planning to do is to invest into more model explainability. This is especially important for large uh, neural networks. And that wraps up our uh, talk today. So thank you. Awesome. Thank you both so much for that. It was definitely a great presentation. Happy to have you both here for some Q&A as well after. I know we've had a lot of great questions that have come in. Uh, the first one, I think you both probably are able to answer pretty well, uh, but it's what was the biggest obstacle you faced when scaling quickly during COVID? Yeah, so uh, that's a very good question and uh, a lot of interesting things happened during the COVID-19, especially for DoorDash, where a lot of people started working from home. So for us, there are definitely a few very uh, challenges in terms of scaling, as to scaling our platform and move fast as well to uh, make sure we can meet the needs of the business. Uh, as well as prioritization because uh, everything was pretty much out of the ordinary. So we need to make sure we move fast and prioritizing on the kind of work that would most impact as well as to support the increased traffic. The other one I would add is also hiring because we need to build a team to build out these capabilities on the platform. Uh, and obviously during the uncertain time, a lot of folks are not interested in, in making a move and so on. So that's at the high level in terms of challenges. And I'm sure Cornell can share additional details about some of the technical aspects. Yeah, so to add to what Hien said, on the technical side, we had to scale up our system in many ways. We had to scale up our uh, Redis cluster uh, to account for the changing uh, traffic patterns and increase in traffic in general. Uh, we had to train a lot of new models because uh, the assumptions about uh, the traffic patterns also changed and the data distribution changed. Uh, so there was a lot of model training. And then we also had to invest into continuous training and higher levels of ML ops. And so we've hit like bottlenecks uh, pretty much on all parts of our platform and then we had to scale up. Very neat to learn about. I know, unfortunately, that's actually all that we do have time for. I know we have a couple other great questions that have come in, so I'll make sure those are over in the ML Ops channel for everyone, and then I'm sure you both can go ahead and chime in there and answer for the audience. Um, but I do want to go ahead and thank you again. It definitely was 
such a great presentation and great learning from you both. And as a quick reminder, we do have Enos uh, Morales from Quantum Black that's going to be discussing algorithmic fairness from theory to practice coming up next. And I'll make sure as well everyone has the link there to hop on over to that uh, presentation. Thank you again. It was great hearing from you both.